Good afternoon. So in today's lesson, we will go over how the heat equation looks like in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. This is an important topic that it will be much more relevant later in the course, because you will see that if you change the coordinates that describe the object from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical or spherical coordinates, all of a sudden, if you follow the uh, same method of solving the respective boundary value problem, it will require quite different ingredients, which in turn, it will require basically having separate chapters to deal with those ingredients. For example, the notion of a Bessel function that we will learn later uh, comes up out of necessity when we try to solve the heat equation in cylindrical coordinates. And consequently, another topic toward the end of the course, Legendre polynomial will pop up naturally when you deal with spherical coordinates. You may wonder why do we bother with this, if, especially if we need a different chapter to, to deal with these things. Well, you'll see immediately that the problem could be extremely difficult or even impossible if the shape of the object is more suitable to uh, cylindrical coordinates, for example, and you insist on using Cartesian coordinates. So in general, if um, the description is very simple in uh, cylindrical or spherical coordinates, it tends to be quite complicated in Cartesian coordinates. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the ability to be able to solve the, um, the equation. But let's actually recall, first of all, what we did last time. So we derived the heat equation in Cartesian coordinates, the familiar x, y, z. And of course, we're going to deal with the one dimensional case in the beginning. But in general, for a 3D object, you're looking at the uh, equation u partial t equals little k, a constant, times the Laplacian, u x x, u y y, plus u z z, the second derivative with respect to x y z. And remember, in this case, the temperature, u denotes the temperature at location x y z and time t. So by u, we mean u of x, y, z, and t. So this is what we derived last time. And remember that the right-hand side of the equation, this uh, uxx plus uyy plus uzz, is called the Laplacian of u. And it's denoted by um, Laplacian of u, this inverted delta, or by delta u. These are possible notations. In, uh, in our books, we use the second one. So the equation in, the, um, in a more compact form can be written like this. All right. What about the, uh, let's do this cylindrical coordinates. So I'm not going to derive the equation. I, I'm just going to write down how the uh, Laplacian, I mean, how the equation looks like in that case. And you're not supposed to memorize, I mean, you don't need to memorize it because the format of the right-hand side of the equation, you will see it's a little bit more complicated in the spherical and cylindrical coordinates. So let's review briefly, and I'm going to use the notation in the book this time around, how the cylindrical coordinates are defined. So if you look at the, and, and of course the relationships between the um, cylindrical coordinates and the um, Cartesian coordinates, if you have a typical point P, um, you identify the point P not by its Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z, so this is x, this is y, and this is z axis. But by the polar coordinates essentially in the plane x, y, so the, basically one of the coordinates is the z. I mean, the z remains the same, okay? I mean, the, the third coordinate z. But instead of x and y, you use the polar coordinates in the, um, of the projection of this point p. So one coordinate is the... Um, angle measure with a positive semi-axis x and this is denoted by phi and the other coordinate will be the distance from the origin to the projection of p over the plane x y which is denoted by rho 
So the three numbers that identify the point P in cylindrical coordinates, so these are the cylindrical coordinates, are the distance from the origin to the projection of P onto the plane X, Y, call it, which we, we're going to call it rho, um, phi, the, um, <clears throat> the angle between um, the uh, positive semi-axis and the um, this segment, OQ, and then the third coordinate is the Cartesian coordinate, Z. So these are the cylindrical coordinates. Now, the Laplacian in this case, I mean the full, let's write down actually the full um, heat equation. So in this case, the temperature again depends on the location of the object, which is now identified by these three cylindrical coordinates, and of course the time t. And the heat equation is going to be u partial t, the left hand side is the same, but the right hand side is k times u partial rho twice plus 1 over rho u partial rho plus 1 over rho squared u partial phi twice and then u partial z twice. <clears throat> So the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates is this big quantity in the parentheses. Let's write it down one more time. All right, so make sure you write this down on a formula sheet. And there are, like I said, other versions for it. These are kind of optional, but be aware that you may see them in various books um, or, uh, you know, as an alternative, basically. These first two terms sometimes can be combined into a more compact form if you so desire. So for example, another version of the Laplacian is going to be 1 over rho, and we can check together to see that that's equivalent. 1 over rho, parenthesis, rho times u partial rho, and then another partial rho on the outside. Remember, the index denotes the differentiation with respect to that variable. And then this, the other two uh, terms are the same. This is just another version, like I said. And if you want to check to see that that's indeed correct, let's take together, let's take the first term and let's show that it's equal to the first two terms here. So I'm going to basically check that uh, this first term, which is one over rho and that partial derivative is equal to the first two terms in the first version here. So all you got to do here is to use the product rule. So I'm going to differentiate with respect to rho, the product between rho and u partial rho. So because of the product rule, that's going to be 1 times u partial rho. Oops. Man, yeah, that's going to be messy. Sorry. One more time. So 1 times u partial rho plus rho times u partial rho twice because you differentiated one more time with respect to rho. And let's see if i distribute this and i start with the last um term one over rho times rho is just u rho par, um, partial rho twice and then plus one over rho u partial rho so again don't overcomplicate this this is just another way of writing the same laplacian in in, in a slightly more com compact form uh, most of them we're going to use the first version anyway it's important to point out that these uh, this 3 uh, uh, d version, right? So this is the heat equation in three dimension for an object in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, you can basically use the same Laplacian for a little bit simpler objects. For example, two dimensional objects in the form of a disc. So instead of a cylinder, let's say you have, for instance, a disc or really any object uh, that can be 
um, written or represented in polar coordinates. If you have an object in the plane, in the xy plane, that means you don't have the z component anymore, you're left essentially with polar coordinates. Because remember, cylindrical coordinates are nothing but polar coordinates combined with the z coordinate. So if I have an object that can be written in terms of polar coordinates, then the heat equation in that case will be, of course, uh, for a variable that depends on just the polar coordinates, rho, phi, and t. So no, no z coordinate. And the Laplace in this case will be the same, except of course u z z. So it'll be just uh, u partial rho twice plus one over rho u partial rho plus one over rho squared u partial phi twice. And you could have even simpler formats. I'll show you on the next page. Um, for example, you may have simplifying assumptions that the heat may not depend on anything but the rate polar radius. So in that case, you can have even easier formats in which the equation depends only on the polar radius. It all has to do with the actual objects, whether it is three-dimensional, bidimensional, and also on various simplifying assumptions that may be relevant, like um, the temperature being dependent only on a subset of variables, not all three of them. And we will make these assumptions later because, as I told you before, we will be able, we will do in this class primarily boundary value problems in two variables. So that will require us to uh, use simplifying assumptions. So on the next page, I'm going to state the equation in spherical coordinates, and then we're going to finish up with um, various easier forms of these equations under you know, a couple of simplifying assumptions. So stay tuned for the next page. All right, so let's review first of all how spherical coordinates look like in relation to the Cartesian coordinates. So once again, let's look at the coordinate system X, Y, Z. And the typical point P on the object is identified by the following three quantities. The first quantity is going to be the distance from the origin to the object itself. Again, to use the notation in the book, the uh, distance is going to be um, OP, I mean, excuse me, denoted by R. And then you look at the projection on the point P onto the plane XY. And the other three quantities that identify the point in this order are the angle measured in the positive way, that is counterclockwise, basically, from the positive semi-axis X to uh, the projection OQ, and that's going to be denoted by um, phi. So that's basically just like before. And then the angle between the positive semi-axis Z and the segment that uh, connects the origin with the point itself, and this is denoted by theta. So in this order, make sure you, I mean, by convention, to keep the convention, the order of the variables are R, phi, and theta. All right, so these are the spherical coordinates. And in this case, the Laplacian is actually quite more complicated than before. So now, again, the temperature of the object is denoted or, you know, modeled by U at R, phi, theta, and t, right? So the, again, the spatial coordinates and then the time t. And then the heat equation, just like before, is gonna be u partial t equals k times the Laplacian of u. And the Laplacian has the format u partial r twice plus two over r u partial r. Make sure you don't confuse it with the um, cylindrical coordinate format because these two terms are very similar. In the cylindrical coordinate format, it was the same, but one over r. Now, the rest of the terms are different than in the cylindrical coordinate case. So the next one will be one plus one over r squared sine squared of theta u partial phi twice plus one over r squared u partial theta twice. 
plus cotangent of theta divided by r squared u partial theta. Stands the reason we will pretty much never going to deal with this full equation, in this class at least. There will be simplifying assumptions or dif different shapes of the object that will require fewer variables, typically either the radius or maybe the radius and one of the angles. So let me write down a couple of equivalent terms for equivalent expressions for, for the Laplacian in uh, spherical coordinates. And when you write down on your formula sheet, so you can have it handy, make sure you write all three versions um, just in case you need one of them. So here's another version that again combines the first, um, I mean, combines the first two terms and the last two in a more compact form. So the first two terms can be combined into one over r, r times u partial r twice. So this combines essentially the first two terms. The middle term is the same. One over r squared sine squared theta u partial phi twice. And then the next term, I mean, the last two of them is going to be one over r squared sine of theta. And you can combine the rest of it into sine theta u partial theta and this product again partial theta on the outside. You can check yourself that this is the case. So I'm going to leave it maybe, well, let's actually check. Um, let's check together that these are equivalent indeed. So I'm going to check that this first term is equivalent to the first two. So let's differentiate twice. Again, we're going to use the product rule because we have r times, and remember, u depends on r, phi, theta, and t. So we do, uh, we differentiate with respect to r twice. So we do it once. So 1 times u plus r, u partial r. And we still have to do another partial r. And that gives me u partial r and another product rule for r times u r. So 1 times u r plus r times u r twice. Uh, so then it's going to be 1 over r, 2 u partial u r plus r u r twice, and then you can distribute r, and I'll give, I'll give me uh, u r twice plus 2 over r, and then u partial r. So again, it's just another way of writing this, the same thing. And as an exercise, well, I guess, I mean, let's actually do it as well. Let's check also the last uh, piece here to see if it's equivalent to the last two uh, terms in the, uh, in the Laplacian. So in that case, I have 1 over r squared sine of theta. And I'm going to do partial theta again using the product rule. So the, the derivative of sine is cosine of theta times u partial theta um, plus sine of theta u partial theta twice. We're going to distribute now. So we have 1 over r squared cosine theta over sine theta u theta plus 1 over r squared sine theta sine theta u partial theta twice. This cancels. And so I'm going to end up with uh, 1 over r squared u theta twice plus cosine over sine is cotangent theta over r squared u theta. Okay, so you see the, the two terms um, over there. All right, so we have, like I said, one version, another version, and there is yet another version as well. A third version basically for the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. Uh, the first two terms can be combined into 1 over r squared quantity r squared times u partial r and that product again partial r and the rest of the uh, terms are the same. Like before. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and that's another version. All right, so on the next page, I'm gonna talk about, like I said, various simplifying assumptions that will uh, make these equations much simpler to deal with. And I'm gonna also introduce the concept of a steady state temperature, which will be the topic of the next uh, lesson. Some of the easier equations we're gonna deal with in the beginning are steady state type of temperature, because you will see in the one dimensional version of the heat equation, that particular uh, equation, which deals with essentially with the long-term behavior or the long-term limiting value of the temperature in the object, uh, that ends up being actually a very simple problem that you could solve just using um, what you learn from differential equations, from ordinary differential equations. So stay tuned for the last page for a um, final discussion on these um, equations and their simplified version. Okay, so let's write down again the equation in cylindrical coordinates that we wrote in the first page. And you don't have to, by the way, you don't have to write it down again. I just want to have it in front of me so I can make a, a little discussion here. So this is in cylindrical coordinates. All right, so there are various situations in which you don't need to actually consider the function as dependent on z. So your function could depend only on rho phi and t instead of rho phi and z. When does that happen? Well, like I said before, maybe you could have just a um, two-dimensional plate as an object. So in that case, of course, there's no z coordinate. So that portion of the, of the Laplacian is going to be equal to zero. Uh, also, you can think of an object in which the heat simply doesn't depend on Z. I mean, the, the, the change in the temperature. Like, uh, for example, it just propagates along the polar radius and the angle, but it doesn't change with respect to, uh, to the Z axis. So some, some sort of like insulation on the vertical. Um, so if you have like, for example, a cylinder, some sort of insulation on any horizontal plane, basically that cuts the object. So you simply assume that the heat can circulate inside the object on the sides and maybe with respect to the angle as well, but not with respect to, to the Z, to the Z axis. So then in, again, you're gonna have a version that has only rho and phi. So then your heat equation in that case will be just, just this. Or even easier, and that'll be basically one of the first equation we're gonna deal with in cylindrical coordinates. Let's just say that, let's suppose that you, uh, or the temperature depends only on rho, right? So for example, let's say you have, for instance, a um, plate in the form of a disc, and then the temperature or the nature of the material and the way the heat propagates is just happen only radially. So basically it doesn't depend on, well, this kind of messy here. So imagine the heat basically propagates only like that from the center to the outside back and forth. But let's say it doesn't depend on the polar angle itself. So either from the center to the exterior along the radii or backwards uh, toward the center. So in that case, your heat, excuse me, your temperature will depend only on the polar radius rho and the time t. And that becomes essentially just like a one dimensional heat equation. So that, that in that case, your heat equation will be ut equals k u rho twice plus one over rho u partial rho. Believe it or not, we're still in the new chapter to deal with this type of equation when the time comes later. So uh, this will be heat equation in cylindrical coordinates under the assumption that u only depends on the radius and the time t.
So as I mentioned before uh, in the previous page, there's also another type of equation. Um, well, actually, let me state the similar thing in for a spherical coordinate, and I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about the steady state problem in the last page. So the similar concept, if you have spherical coordinates. Um, let's say you have uh, uh, the, so I'm going to write down again the, the equation in the general case. So it's going to be u partial t equals k u rho twice plus 2 over r u r natural r. And then the rest of the terms. Again, you don't have to write it down again if you, if you already did that. And let's say, for instance, you have an object kind of like a sphere. And suppose that, again, the heat propagates just around radii, along the radius, or any radius of the object. So let's say that the temperature really depends only on R and T, not on the other two angles, which represent the spherical coordinates. So in that case, of course, the Laplacian is reduced only to the first two terms because anything that is with respect to partial phi or partial theta, this will be all zero, right? It won't depend on phi or theta. So basically you don't even need to consider basically you as depending on phi and theta in that case. So then the heat equation in that particular case will be k ut equals k times ur twice plus two over r ur. It's very important to look at these two side by side because we're gonna deal with them later and make sure you don't confuse them because they're very close to each other, right? I mean, rho is the distance from the, um, um, from the center to the projection of the point on the xy plane. But if you have a two dimensional object, that's just the distance from um, the origin to the point itself. And r in the spherical coordinate case, it's also the distance between the point and uh, this, the origin and the point itself. But the overall equation is different. There's this two over r, that's the only difference. Although you will see that actually the difference is big enough to require um, you know, a different technique to deal with when the time comes. But in this most simplified version of cylindrical or spherical coordinates, make sure you don't confuse the two because they're pretty close to each other in their format. Now the notation also helps in the sense that make it a habit to use a different notation, rho, the distance the, for, to the origin in the case of cylindrical coordinates and r for spherical coordinates. So if you keep these two separate, there's a less risk of confusion between the two. So on the last page, we're gonna uh, talk about a little bit um, what, what I mean by steady state temperature and uh, how the, these equations look like in um, Cartesian cylindrical and spherical coordinates. All right, so what is the steady state temperature equation, basically? That's the question. Or what is the steady state temperature in general? Well, the idea is the following. Imagine that given, so suppose, let's put it this way. So suppose that given certain initial and or boundary conditions, As t goes to infinity, the temperature stabilizes in the sense that it won't depend on time anymore. It may depend on location, but suppose you reach a point in which it won't change anymore in time. Now, this may or may not be true depending on the boundary conditions and the uh, shape of the object and many other factors. But assuming this happens, and you will see various examples in which it may or may not happen, but assuming this happens, that given certain setup of the experiment, if you wait long enough, 
that's the meaning uh, of t goes to infinity. So if we wait long enough, the temperature will stabilize in the object with respect to the time at least, right? I mean, it, it won't change anymore uh, with respect to the time. So that means uh, later on, if you pick any point on the object, it will have the same temperature um, 10 minutes later, an hour later, and so on and so forth. So assuming that happens, then the question is, what is then the temperature at each location of the object? This is the so-called steady state temperature. <clears throat> so steady state temperature uh, basically means the limit, the temperature as t goes to infinity. So another name for the steady state temperature is the temperature, um, you know, like uh, in the Cartesian coordinates, for example, will be u of x, y, z, t as t goes to infinity. Now, if indeed that happens, if the temperature stabilizes as t goes to infinity, then the temperature, the steady state temperature, this limit temperature, this limiting temperature, won't depend on T anymore, you know, if you wait long enough. So that gives us a way to actually find this steady state temperature. So in the Cartesian coordinates case, so let's start with the Cartesian coordinate. Right, so you have the object and you have the heat equation in the Cartesian coordinates. Let's look it up like the, um, you know, in the three-dimensional case. If indeed the temperature stabilizes, you reach a point in which the temperature only depends on x, y, and z, you know, eventually, as t goes to infinity. When you reach that state, the characterization of that state is that the temperature won't change with respect to the time, which mathematically means u partial t is equal to zero. So that's basically the way you set up on how to find a steady state temperature. You assume that at some point the temperature won't change with respect to the time, that is to say the derivative with respect to t is zero, and therefore the right-hand side of the equation can be set equal to zero. And that's the equation that should give you the steady state temperature if it exists. So in this case, you will assume when you solve for the steady state temperature that your u depends only on x, y, z. So in other words, you set up the Laplacian equal to zero. This equation is called the Laplace equation. And in the context of the heat equation, because the Laplacian, by the way, it, it, it appears in other equations as well, but in the context of the heat equation, the Laplace equation gives you the steady state temperature, provided such a state exists. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you use cylindrical coordinates, and you assume that the temperature stabilizes, then uh, in that case, the steady state temperature or the Laplace equation will simply be um, the uh, Laplacian in the um, cylindrical coordinates. And then equal to zero. And again, assuming that the, for example, if U only depends on rho and phi, uh, then in that case, the steady state temperature equation will be just the first three terms. In cases like this, when you, when you set it equal to zero, you can also see in various parts of the problems of book, um, the same equation written differently without fractions. If you multiply by rho squared, all sides, you end up with rho squared u partial rho twice, plus rho u partial rho plus u phi twice. And that's slightly more compact format for the steady state temperature in cylindrical coordinates. And so the last thing, of course, in spherical coordinates, 
um, you know, I'm gonna, so you, you're gonna set up the whole thing equal to zero, right? The Laplacian equal to zero, uh, two over R, U, R only, sorry, that's just a single R here, plus one over uh, R squared, sine squared theta, U phi twice, one over R squared U theta twice, and then finally cotangent of theta over r squared u theta equals zero. And with that, I think it's enough for today. We're, we're gonna go over a couple of ex simple example of the steady state temperature in, um, well, we're gonna first of all set up some boundary conditions because we didn't do that yet in Cartesian coordinates. And then we're gonna solve the steady state temperature uh, in the one-dimensional case, which is pretty straightforward. So stay tuned for the, I mean, uh, well, not stay tuned. I'll see you next time.